Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Experian Quarterly Business Credit Review for Q2 2018. I'm Gary Stockton. Before I introduce our speakers, I would like to remind you to take the opportunity to engage our experts using the question answer box in your WebEx applet. We'll try to answer as many questions as possible at the end of uh, today's remarks. If you are having any technical difficulties, I would just advise to go to help.webex.com. Sometimes just restarting WebEx and um, restarting the program will solve a lot of that and clear a lot of that up. Hopefully you can enjoy it. Otherwise, we will have a recording later on today on the website with links to today's presentation. Um, if you would like to follow along with us, you can download a copy of today's slides and follow along with us. Uh, go to bit.ly, that's B-I-T dot L-Y slash Q2 18 QBCR. It's a bit of a mouthful, that. We'll keep the link in the lower right side of each slide um, so you can access that or just grab it later from the, the follow-up link that we will send later on today. During today's webinar, we'll be discussing key findings in the just released Experian Moody's Analytics Main Street Report for Q2 2018. Our speakers today will be Gavin Harding of Experian, Derek G. McCrank, and Christian Derridis from Moody's Analytics. Gavin's a senior business consultant with Experian's advisory services with more than 20 years in banking and finance. Gavin leverages his experience to develop sophisticated data and analytical solutions to solve challenges and develop strategies across the customer lifecycle for global banking and fintech clients. Derek Grunfelder McCrank is an associate economist at Moody's Analytics and a member of the Credit Analytics Group in Westchester, Pennsylvania. Derek works on building stress testing models of consumer loan performance for a number of consulting projects. He has a bachelor's degree in economics from the University of Wisconsin-Whitewater. And Chris DeRibis is a senior director at Moody's Analytics, where he manages a team of economists focused on consumer credit modeling and analysis for banks, investors, fintechs, and other financial institutions. He provides regular commentary to clients and the media on the state of consumer credit and small business. He received a PhD and a master's in economics from Johns Hopkins University for his work on income inequality and technological change. And currently, Chris is developing methods for incorporating economic forecasts into loss allowance estimates in order to comply with the new accounting rule for CESOL. And now I'd like to turn it over to Chris Derridis from Moody's Analytics. Great. Well, thank you very much, Gary, and thank everyone for joining us here on the call here. Very nice to have you once again this quarter to talk about small business and small business credit in particular. So I'm going to kick us off with an overview of the economy, and small businesses do depend heavily on the strength of the overall economy, so it's uh, important to take a look at and see how the economy is doing at the moment, and that will certainly give us uh, some indication of how small businesses will perform and how they'll uh, be able to pay on their bills over the next uh, few quarters. So getting right into it, if we focus on uh, growth or output in the economy, we can see some very, very encouraging signs in terms of um, the strength or resiliency of the, of the economy at the moment. Right on the chart here, we're looking at um, quarter over quarter changes in uh, output or GDP uh, growth on an annualized basis. And if you look at the uh, last bar in the chart here, that's uh, for Q2 of this year, what you can see is that the economy grew at a 4.1% at a rate again, on, on an annualized basis, and that's the fastest it's grown since uh, 2014, so very encouraging sign uh, right there. You can see back that in uh, 2014, the economy did actually grow a little bit faster, around 5% for a couple quarters, but then it, it didn't maintain that, uh, that growth pattern. It uh, slipped back to a growth rate of around 2 to 2.5% as we've had really since the end of the recession. So uh, it's encouraging to see this 4.1% uh, growth rate uh, in the last quarter, but we want to be a little bit cautious as we think ahead and uh, understand if this is something that's very permanent or if this is something that's, that's more transitory. Just to get a sense of where the growth is coming from, again, that's very important as we think about small businesses and composition of their, uh, their industries and their geographies. Most of the growth uh, came from consumption, so the, uh, the tax cuts that we had at the end of uh, last year and the deficit financed uh, fiscal spending that went into effect earlier this year, uh, encouraged some additional consumption, and that uh, that is showing up in the data here, and it should continue to uh, 
support uh, economic growth of the next few quarters. So certainly those tax cuts are helping uh, boost confidence on the part of uh, both consumers and businesses. Business investment, that's the green bar in the chart here, is also uh, a contributor to growth uh, in the last quarter. And uh, certainly that's, again, a, a direct result of the, uh, the tax cuts that went to effect. Corporate profits, business profits are uh, near record highs uh, once again. So that's uh, certainly encouraging some additional expansion or some additional investment. And uh, that investment contributed about a, a percentage point to the 4.1% uh, growth rate. Then on top of that, we did have a little bit of a detraction in inventories or subtraction in terms of inventories. We, uh, we spent down some of the inventories that we have. But perhaps the, uh, the biggest story here and something that will kind of uh, set the stage for the rest of the outlook is what we saw in terms of net export. So the little yellow bar in, in, the, uh, in the chart here uh, contributed about a, a percentage point to, uh, to growth as well. And what we saw there as we uh, dig into the data is that net exports actually rose in the last quarter really in anticipation of some of the tariffs uh, that have been now, in, now, how, now have been imposed and will be imposed uh, presumably over the next uh, few quarters. Right, so there was some advanced purchases of soybeans, for example, by Chinese uh, consumers um, that uh, led to a little bit of a boost in night exports. So that's, that's certainly a positive, but we want to be a little bit cautious as we think ahead as that's unlikely to be repeated. I've also uh, included our forecast here, so you can see immediately what, what we're thinking in terms of uh, where the economy might be headed. Expectation under our baseline is that uh, a lot of the stimulus that we're experiencing now in terms of tax cuts and fiscal uh, spending is going to wear off over the next year, right? So you can see the, the, that red dotted line uh, does start to decline and get back closer to about a 2% a uh, growth rate in 2019 after a something closer to a 3% growth rate in 2018. So you have the, uh, the reduction of some of that fiscal stimulus, and at the same time, you have some increases in interest rates that we'll talk about, and that's going to cause the economy to, uh, to slow down over the next couple of years. You see that our baseline just avoids a, a, a technical recession in 2020, but we get awfully close to that zero growth line uh, in the second quarter of 2020. So there, the economy will be at uh, certainly at higher risk of a potential recession. If something doesn't go right, if we get another shock, there is, there is that risk out there. And you can certainly see that in our scenario three, a, a downside scenario uh, that shows some of that uh, potential uh, decline. So overall, things look quite, quite positive uh, when it comes to the economy. And nowhere do we see more of that enthusiasm or that uh, energy than in the uh, labor market. Right, so the job market is really a, a sign of a lot of the strength in the labor mar in the uh, in the economy right now, and when we look at labor market statistics, it's actually a very very encouraging uh, picture. Right, so the unemployment rate is down to 3.9 percent, a level that we haven't seen since 2000, um, and we actually have to go back to the 60s if we want to get back to see this level uh, back in history. So we're in a, a very positive, very tight uh, labor market from that perspective. The uh, number of job openings right now is uh, at a record high, as you can see on the right-hand side of the chart here, about 6.8 million job openings at the moment. So there are more job openings today than there are actually officially unemployed people. So that's, uh, that's very encouraging from a, a labor market standpoint. Consumers, again, feeling very confident that uh, the, there are jobs out there, and uh, they're feeling so confident that uh, many uh, consumers, many households are, are willing to quit their jobs. That's the blue line that you can see on the chart here as well and uh, take other jobs. And that's an indication of, of confidence of the highest magnitude, right? People don't quit their jobs unless they feel very confident in the future of the economy. So labor market looks very strong. That tightness in the labor market is going to lead some, to some higher wages, right? As, uh, as businesses have to compete uh, for, for workers. That should put money, more money into households' pockets and that should lead to some additional consumption. That's very favorable for small business, uh, given how many are in retail or cater to consumers directly. So that's, that's the positive spin of things. The more negative spin, of course, from a business perspective is that these higher uh, or these tighter labor markets are making it harder to find qualified workers, and they're also going to have to pay up for those workers. So their cost uh, basis is going to increase as well. So a little bit of a balancing act there, but the uh, demand seems to be outstripping the, the supply uh, constraints at the moment. So that's very positive, uh, again, uh, from a, of an overall uh, business and household perspective. 
small businesses are certainly participating in this uh, labor market. They are hiring. Um, uh, according to data that uh, we received from ADP, uh, uh, small businesses added about 53,000 uh, employees to their payrolls in the month of July. And here I'm defining small business as a, as a business with less than 50 employees. So clearly they've been uh, engaged. They are seeing the demand out there for their goods and services, and that, that's, uh, that is a positive. The other point to make on the slide here, though, is that uh, about 85% of all small business employment is in services uh, versus goods, right? That's, again, based on data that we have uh, uh, from ADP. And that's important as we think about some of the risks uh, to, this, to this outlook, particularly as we're thinking about uh, interest, interest rates and, more importantly, when we're thinking about tariffs. Right. Given that uh, small businesses are largely concentrated in these uh, service industries, domestically focused service industries, they're somewhat immune from those uh, tariffs and the, what's going on in, in export markets. There are certainly small businesses that do export, particularly to Mexico and Canada, uh, but uh, by and large, uh, much, of the, much of the small business uh, world is really focused more on, on domestic consumption. So to the extent a tariff impacts them, it's going to be more indirect than, uh, than direct. So that's where I'd like to focus. I'm going to focus on two risks uh, to this forecast. Uh, one is on tariffs, one, the other one is on interest rate. And starting with the, uh, the tariff uh, issue, I, what I did is run a, I ran a couple of uh, simulations using our macroeconomic model just to understand what impact some of the different tariff uh, proposals or policies could have on the economy overall. So what you're looking at on the chart here is the difference in our baseline projection of, uh, of output growth or GDP growth versus these different uh, tariff scenarios. And I ran three tariff scenarios. One is uh, imposed tariff scenarios. So that's actually where we are today. We have now imposed uh, tariffs on steel, aluminum, solar panels, and washing machines, as well as a 25% uh, tariff on about $50 billion, $50 billion worth of uh, Chinese goods. China has responded with a, a tit-for-tat tariff, right, 25% tariff on uh, about $50 billion worth of, of U.S. goods as well. So that is, uh, that's uh, reflected in this uh, purple line, in the, in the top line of, of the scenarios here. Mm -hmm. And you can see that under this current uh, regime, we already expect to see some impact on GDP, but it's, it's relatively mild. So they're going to subtract about a tenth of a percent from GDP. Well, we will hardly notice it in terms of the overall uh, statistics. Obviously, individual industries, individual geographies that are concentrated on these tariffs are feeling the pinch, uh, but in a uh, $20 trillion economy, $50 billion worth of uh, tariffs really doesn't, uh, doesn't do much uh, to move the needle. Where things do get a little bit more interesting is in the, uh, on the next two simulations I ran. The threatened tariffs uh, scenario is the uh, a uh, tariff that has been proposed by the administration on about $200 billion worth of Chinese goods, so upping the ante, if you will, from 50 to $200 billion. And I ran a 10% uh, tariff scenario here. There's been some discussion of whether it's 10% or 25%, and certainly there would be some impact depending on that, but I, I ran the 10% number here. And here what you can see is that the, this, uh, this tariff would certainly have a, a bit more bite in terms of uh, GDP tracked off about a half a percent uh, from GDP in 2019. Now, obviously, that's more uh, of an impact. Certainly, it's going to be felt in uh, certain labor markets and certain uh, industries as well. But given the current state of the economy, given that there is still a lot of strength uh, in the economy, this is certainly something that is, uh, uh, can be absorbed within the current uh, situation. It's not going to pull the economy into recession, uh, even if we go down this path. You can also see that our projection would, uh, would see that the economy would adjust. Businesses would find new ways to either import from other places or change their, their practices. And uh, over time, the economy would, would recover uh, from this type of uh, tariff. Where the real risk is, is in a, what I label a, a trade conflagration uh, scenario. This is a proposal of 25% tariffs on all of Chinese imports, so about $505 billion worth of Chinese imports. On top of that, we layer in a, a breakdown in uh, the uh, NAFTA accords, Mexico and China, some uh, repercussions in Europe, 
and then a wand devaluation. So that uh, increases the cost uh, to U.S. exports as well. So this is a very, uh, very negative, very, very much a downside type of scenario. This is kind of worst case, if you will, in terms of what could go wrong if the trade problems uh, do escalate. And here you do see that we would lose about 2% in terms of GDP growth, and this would certainly get us into uh, recession territory. But at the moment, I don't expect this to uh, have high probability. It does seem as though there are people are working hard to try to avoid uh, further uh, trade disruptions here. Uh, but there's certainly a risk that things don't, uh, don't pan out, that agreements can't be made between the U.S. and China, and we could end up in a situation like this. And that's certainly something that we want to uh, guard against. If you are lenders, certainly you'd want to think about this particular scenario as you're managing your, your book of business. So to that extent, you'd want to focus on certain industries that are uh, certainly um, uh, exposed uh, this, to these types of uh, tariffs, right? The targeted tariffs of the of the of China as well as the U.S. And uh, where those industries are particularly located geographically across the country could have a big impact on your potential losses, right? So in the map here, I've just highlighted some of the areas that would be most impacted by this uh, trade uh, conflagration uh, type of scenario. We can think about the Northwest being impacted due to all the uh, <clears throat> exports in terms of uh, airplane manufacturing that go on in that part of the country and all the small businesses that are related to the, that type of activity. You have agriculture being act, uh, impacted in the Midwest. And then that, particularly in the South, you'd have uh, impact in terms of energy and uh, some of the agricultural commodity exports. Um, that we produce uh, in, in those parts of the countries as well. So as you're thinking about your portfolio, once again, you'd want to be very cognizant of where you have concentrations, both in terms of industry, what are the targeted industries for the tariffs, as well as the geographies associated with those particular industries. And that uh, certainly would have some impact in terms of your potential exposure or your potential risk uh, to, these, uh, to these tariffs. Now related to the tariffs is a, uh, or a consequence of the tariffs rather, uh, could be some inflation, right? So this is something certainly that the Fed is uh, very keen on uh, avoiding. If we look at uh, uh, PCE inflation, so personal consumption uh, expenditures uh, inflation, we can see that the inflation has been rising over the last uh, few years here, and that's certainly something that the Fed wants to avoid. We've never done well as a country with, uh, with high inflation, so we want to ensure that some of the potential for overheating is, is restricted, and the Fed is... Um, taking steps to avoid that by uh, increasing or, uh, interest rates or tightening up on monetary policy. Uh, if you have any doubt that uh, some of the tariff issues we're talking about here could lead to higher inflation, you just have to look at uh, what has happened to laundry equipment uh, this year in terms of their prices. Uh, we imposed a significant tariff on washing machines earlier in this year, and uh, we can see that the prices on those washing machines overall now have uh, really skyrocketed as a direct result of that. So if we were to expand the tariffs to more and more products, we can expect, we can expect even more inflationary pressures on top of the inflationary pressures that we're getting from a very tight labor market and the wages that are rising there. So that's the other thing to watch. Uh, again, related to the tariffs is the impact of inflation and what that inflation impact could have on uh, interest rates in particular, right? So I mentioned the, uh, the Fed is very vigilant. They're going to hike rates in September, and most likely they're going to hike rates again in, in December to avoid uh, some of the, the risk of overheating. The, uh, the risk in terms of uh, small business performance then is really in terms of the direct impact on the cost of borrowing of small businesses. So higher rates trans into higher costs, and that could certainly put them at risk of, uh, of default, if not... Uh, seeing some of the revenue uh, decline because of a, a slowing economy. And the other risk, just, just to point out, is in terms of the inversion of the yield curve. And this has gotten a lot of attention uh, recently, so um, I'm sure most people are aware of what, what this is, but essentially the difference between the 10-year and the one-year Treasury has in the past been indicative of uh, economic weakness, or it's at least been associated with economic weakness. So if you do see this so-called inversion of the yield curve where the short-term rate rises above the, uh, the longer-term rate. Uh, in the past, over the past 10 recessions, that has always preceded uh, a contraction or economic uh, downturn. Right now, the, the difference is uh, still positive, right? So we're not, we're not quite at that point of uh, inversion, but it is trending downward, and so certainly so something to watch. 
That said, even if we did get an inversion, it would be some time, it, uh, and you'd have to have other factors to really uh, enhance any type of uh, recession, But because on average, the, the length of time between an inversion and a recession has been about 12 months. So you, you would potentially have some advanced warning. So something clearly to watch. I don't think it's a causal factor, but something you definitely would want to keep an eye on. So with that, I think the uh, economic outlook, uh, again, remains quite uh, optimistic, certainly in the, in the short term. We are likely to uh, become, this is likely to become the longest expansion in history in July of next year. But there are some uh, risks out there that you want to keep an eye on. With that, I'm going to turn the floor over to Derek to uh, now take some of this more macro level data and focus uh, a bit more specifically on the impact on small business credit. Uh, Derek? All right. Well, thank you, Chris. Uh, hi, everybody. I always like to start out my portion of the presentation by uh, talking a little bit about the partnership that we at Moody's Analytics have with Experian and uh, being able to put out the Main Street report. Uh, this report involves looking at data from over 7.5 million small businesses. As such, it's perhaps the most comprehensive view of small business credit out there, um, which I think presents a great deal of uh, value added in terms of information that we can provide. So that's a little bit of background about our report and uh, its value. Um, overall, in the second quarter, the outlook for small business credit remained unchanged at a positive level. Um, so what we've seen is that in terms of credit performance, small businesses have been doing quite well for the last few years. As you can see from this slide, uh, delinquency buckets, every single delinquency bucket we track has been going down consistently over this time, uh, particularly at um, the 30 and 91 plus day levels. And uh, those are important to look at. But perhaps uh, what gives us a little bit of a better view is the 90-day bucket, which is the blue line on your screen. And the reason that I say this is uh, the more severe category, 91 plus, tends to be where delinquent accounts sort of gather before they move into a charge-off state. So it isn't necessarily the most uh, current view of credit performance in the small business sphere. So if you look at that blue line, you'll see it's been very steady and perhaps even uh, a little dull over the last few years because nothing has really been happening. Uh, there haven't been large movements, which is a very good thing for small business credit. So looking at this, you can see that there's been consistently good performance for quite a while in this uh, area. One of the things that I've been talking about for the last couple of quarters in the report is the bankruptcy rate and how it moved up slightly at the end of last year. And then this year, it's sort of leveled off around 0.16%. Um, that seems to be a fairly good area for uh, the bankruptcy rate. It's moving things out of that 91 plus day category as accounts are being charged off and going into bankruptcy. But it isn't, it isn't moving up. It isn't too high. It's, it's a very healthy level uh, to move out old credit and allow uh, lending institutions to have confidence in providing new uh, credit to small businesses. Another trend that we've been seeing is in the utilization rate. Um, it's been moving down lately. One of the reasons for this is that available credit is much higher than utilized credit, obviously, from the rate. Um, but because of that nominal balance in available credit being so much higher, we see that even though uh, this rate or nominal credit available is growing at 1.3% and uh, in the second quarter, utilized credit grew slightly higher at 1.5% because that available amount is so much higher even with less growth, we can see uh, a downward movement in the utilization rate. Uh, moving along, 
into a little more depth about the balances of outstanding small business credit. Uh, what you see on your screen here is year-over-year -year change in balances and average change in balances. So the average credit outstanding per business. And you'll see the green line, which is the average credit outstanding per business is growing. It's still positive, though at a much lesser rate than the purple line representing total balance outstanding growth. And uh, the reason for this is in the last three quarters, there have been quite a few new businesses coming into uh, the data set, which means that either new businesses are forming or existing businesses which hadn't been tapping credit markets actively have begun to utilize credit markets more and are drawing on either existing lines of credit which had been dormant or new lines of credit. Uh, what this means for small business lending is it's going up right now and because you have new businesses coming in, you can diversify your risk across a wider pool of businesses so this is, this is a positive trend for small business lenders and one that we've seen happening for the last several quarters and which doesn't look uh, likely to change as long as the economy continues to perform well and uh, small businesses continue to utilize credit markets to fund their operations. So because of what you saw on the last slide, I do like to bring in the SBA data, which you see on your screen now, because the, the level of growth that we see in our portfolio or in Experian's uh, data set is very high, and we need a bit of a, a check to make sure that what we're seeing is, is accurate. Um, so what you see now is SBA lending, which combines SBA 7A and 504-backed uh, small business loans. And you'll see in the bars that SBA lending is down slightly through June, uh, through June of the fiscal year for the SBA, which is their third quarter, our second quarter, um, down from about $22.5 billion in 2017 Q3 to uh, about $22 billion in uh, fiscal 2018 Q3. Um, so you see this negative growth right here. Last quarter, it was positive, uh, mostly in balance growth rather than count growth, which sort of backs up uh, what we saw in the last slide where the SBA portfolio is also seeing aggressive growth that sort of that was very strong from uh, the fourth and first quarter, fourth quarter of 2017, first quarter of 2018, and has been slowing down as we moved into 2018. That corresponds with uh, our growth story and gives us uh, confidence in our numbers. Another quick uh, check to look at what's actually happening in terms of demand for small business lending. Um, you can see that in the first quarter of the year, there was a slight, uh, slight positive bump in demand for small business lending among small firms, which is the purple line on your screen. So in the first quarter, a net percent of about seven, six or seven percent of uh, lending institutions reported that small businesses were demanding more commercial and, and industrial loans. Uh, whereas in the second quarter, we saw that that demand turned negative. And that corresponds with the SBA story that we were just looking at on the last slide where uh, growth turned down in, in the second quarter of the year, the SBA's uh, fiscal third quarter. So this is, again, just another another sanity check on that growth, and, and we see a confirmation of the story we're telling, which is that balances are rising, lending is increasing, things are looking good in the small business credit market at the moment. From a regional perspective, we see that across the country, 
things are generally uh, conditions are generally strong for small business credit. However, there are pockets of weakness, relatively. Um, when I say weakness, it's still it's still pretty good performance relative to you know history, but uh, in at the moment it is uh, it is weaker performance. So you see um, in the upper plain states and in the southwest. Uh, severe delinquencies are higher than in the rest of the country, and currently uh, the Rocky Mountain region, so uh, states like Colorado, Montana, uh, Utah, are are performing worse than, say, states in New England or the Southeast, where severe delinquencies are very low, at you know 0.4 or 0.44 percent. Uh, we see delinquency rates up around 0.6, 0.65% uh, for those center for those central states. And part of this uh, gets down to the industries that are in those states. So, as I said, the Rocky Mount, <coughs> excuse me, the Rocky Mountain region had the highest severe delinquency rate in the second quarter, and a lot of that was driven by uh, weakness in the mining sector. So you'll see uh, the purple line on your screens here. <clears throat> Mining delinquencies rose from 0.9% to 1.6% in in the second quarter, uh, which is a pretty big jump. So we expect some payback over the next couple of quarters, where that performance will uh, increase, Im will improve a little bit. That delinquency rate will decrease. Um, Another thing that we do expect from this, though, is you'll see the brown line at the bottom, or which had been at the bottom uh, of these industries for quite a while, has moved above uh, the blue manufacturing line. And in states like Colorado, we've highlighted in the past that there's correlation between rising mining delinquencies and rising uh, delinquencies in the transportation and utility industries. So we do expect a little deterioration in performance in the transportation utility industries in the Rocky Mountain region sometime in the next couple of quarters. Um, but it shouldn't be anything uh, too severe. But there is, there does appear to be a relationship between the mining and transportation industries in terms of credit performance. Uh, so that's a bit of the regional and the industry perspective. Now I'm going to turn it over to Gavin, and uh, we can hear from him. Thank you, Derek, and uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, so we've looked at the macro level questions. Uh, Derek dug a little bit into some of the specific industries and some of the regional variations. So what we'd like to do now is take a few minutes and look at some of the variations in terms of uh, types of financing. So we'll look at your know, commercial credit card versus installment loan, or we'll look at lines of credit and so on. Our theory here is that each of those forms of credit or financing addresses different types of need within the small business area. So a commercial credit card is readily accessible. The balance can be run up pretty quickly. Uh, it tends to be a good indicator of uh, you know, what's happening in terms of working capital. It tends to be a little bit of a lead indicator in terms of performance. So we'll go through those in a little bit more detail and try and get a feel for below the macro level data, below the regional data what's happening on a product-by-product product basis or facility-by-facility facility basis. So to do that, we look at a little bit of a different data set. So we call this data set, it's a, an Experian data set called uh, Small Business Credit Share. So this is a data set that covers a broad range of, of, uh, of segments, but it's focused on small business. So it includes very, very detailed information uh, from banks, credit card companies, utilities, telecoms companies, and so on, that goes beyond just what we would normally see in terms of commercial business reporting. So it gives us a little bit more detail, gives us a little bit more of an opportunity to dive more deeply into the data. 
Let's think about the regions we're going to look at. So we have five regions in the U.S. We're going to look at each of these products, each of these financial uh, financial products uh, across these regions and look at variations year over year. We're going to start with commercial car. Now this slide's a little busy, so let's just take a couple of moments and look at it. So we have three numbers for each of the regions. Under commercial credit cards, you have the average balance, the 91 days past due balance, and the balance charged off for each region. And then right beside that, you've got the percentage changes. So let's just, uh, let me, let me uh, offer a word of caution. The overall picture is very, very good as Christian and Derek outlined. Uh, it's important as we look at these numbers to understand as we think about year over year, uh, in absolute terms, we may not be talking about a lot of money or a lot of units, but we could be talking about a significant percentage change. So let me give you an example. So on commercial credit cards, let's look at the let's look at the highs and the lows in terms of balances. So when we look at um, the Southwest, we look at you know at states like Texas and that whole southwestern region. Uh, we've got average balances of forty seven hundred dollars thereabouts. That is a pretty significant increase, twenty two percent over where it was last year. The 91-day pass-through element of this is uh, 74 basis points. That is a 5% increase over last year, so not really material. Overall, overall uh, levels are good. And then finally, when we look at the charged off percentages, down about 10% year over year. So again, it matches the overall picture of positive sustainable credit performance. And you can see some of those other variations uh, across states. Let's look at the, at the west and northwest. Balance is up 14%. Um, 91 day past due balance is up slightly, but still well within manageable terms. Balance charged off down. So again, supports the overall positive outlook. So when we look in a little bit more detail at this, we say, okay, well, what's What's happening in that 91 days past due trend? So when you take a first look at this uh, illustration, you, you look at the Q1 versus Q2 of 2018, and it looks like a pretty big bump. Let me, let me put it in context for you. So the first thing is, in absolute terms, it is not that significant. And when we look back across the trend, you know, we'll see we were up in Q4 2016, we were down Q2 2017, up Q4 2017, uh, down in Q1 2018. So, so the most recent variations are, are still within trend, uh, so we don't see any dramatic concern or cause for concern there. So that's delinquency, it's severe delinquency. Let's look at originations. So the blue line is kind of interesting, that tells us what the average credit limit was on new commercial card originations. And then the, the blocks tell us what percentage of the overall portfolio that was. So we can see that the average credit limit over the last couple of quarters has dropped a little bit. Again, not significant, not dramatic. We see that the uh, the percentage of account originations has dropped a little bit too, from 1.39 to 1.29 of all outstanding accounts. No major cause of concern, no dramatic shifts. Uh, it's more like a trend we will continue to watch and uh, and uh, uh, see what happens. So bring a little a little bit further down account originations by risk. Uh, one thing I just want to show you here is the high risk category. That's that light brown line at the top of the screen. We've seen over the last couple of quarters a little bit of increase on that. It is, again, a measure of quality in terms of account originations. Uh, in percentage terms, we might look at that and be concerned. However, I want to point out two things. Now, the first is all the other categories are low and continue to trend 
uh, there continues to be a stable trend. So in terms of overall portfolios, stable. Uh, the second thing is this, you know, we look at the last quarter versus this quarter, you know, yes, the high or the medium high risk category was up a little bit, but now we see it start to turn and come down. No great cause for concern there. Okay, let's look at average balances by risk. And again, this is, this is the whole portfolio. The interesting comparisons here are quarter over quarter. So the blue line versus the pink line. So we look at the high risk category. We're seeing that the balances have increased in that category. Now remember, this is, this is an assessment of risk based on scores. This is not actual performance. This is based on uh, uh, Experian credit scores. And this is the overall portfolio. So it includes originations from uh, over a long time frame. So they are definitely averages. So in terms of the overall portfolio and the high risk category, those balances have creeped up, crept up. You can look across the, all the ranges, all the, high, all the risk categories and see that there has been a general increase. Now, you need to understand or we need to take that within the context of charge offs, severe delinquencies, actual performance. So balances are going up, but the actual performance overall has not deteriorated. Average balances by risk category, this is another illustration of the same thing. Balances have increased overall. You see the high risk category increased overall. However, However, this is this this is the score based assessment of risk. So the actual performance has not deteriorated dramatically. And again, we are not concerned uh, at a high level uh, about these trends unless they continue. So commercial credit cards are we think of them as a leading edge a red, leading edge indicator a a readily accessible source of funds for the small business. Let's look at installment loans. Installment loans require a lot more thought, uh, a lot more work to get them. Um, generally, they require a higher level of analysis. Uh, often they are secured, so they're a little bit, a little bit different to commercial credit cards. So same regions, same types of data. Let's, let's uh, pick one and, uh, and look at it in a little bit more detail. So if we pick the upper Midwest year over year, the average balance on installment loans is 169,000. That's down almost 10% year over year. The balance 90 days past due is up. When you look at it in, pure, in, in percentage terms, varying year over year, 31% variation can seem like a lot. But again, I'd like to call your attention to the fact that we are talking about a 1.21%. Uh, delinquency rate, which is well within acceptable uh, ranges. And then finally, and perhaps most interestingly, we have a 0.27% charge off rate um, down almost 50% year over year. So as we look at, at the data on installment loans, as we look at balances and delinquencies across the whole country, we do not see anything that would contradict that overall positive outlook. When we look at originations, origination balances are basically uh, uh, flat in terms of the average balance originated. The uh, percentage of uh, the portfolio uh, that's new or was originated in the past quarter is relatively low. We see no major cause for concern there. We look at risk, what's being put into the portfolios, and we see similarly to the commercial credit cards that we have a little bit of an uptick in the medium risk category, medium high risk category, but again, in pure variations uh, of quarter over quarter, nothing, nothing dramatic, nothing that we really seem to be concerned over. Let's look back over the last several six, eight quarters, uh, then the 6.99 is definitely within reasonable tolerances. 
average balance risk. So the growth, this is the growth quarter over quarter, sorry, excuse me, by quarter, year over year. Uh, the interesting thing about this is you're not seeing the same variations year over year that we saw on the commercial card portfolios. Relatively consistent uh, volumes, dollar values. Uh, when we look at the portfolios, the medium risk, low risk, uh, low medium risk segment uh, accounts for the majority of the portfolios. Uh, the high risk is relatively uh, is a relatively low percentage. So once again, this is giving us an indication that the overall quality of the portfolios in terms of uh, risk scores, risk rankings, is good. One word of caution, again, we're looking at scores. This is not actual performance. The actual performance continues to be solid, consistent, and positive. Lines of credit, somewhere between a commercial card and an installment loan, we think about lines of credit as uh, you know, a, a relatively, relatively uh, easily accessible uh, form of working capital. It takes a little more effort than a commercial card, um, but these are the lines that we paid up and down. Um, they tend to be a good lead indicator, not quite as powerful as a commercial card, but worth taking a look at. When we look at lines of credit, here's the general trend when you look at this year over year. Almost across the board, Balances, uh, the average balances, the 90-day plus balances, and the charge-off balances are down across the country, almost without exception. This is positive and supports that overall uh, good, sustainable uh, outlook that we are uh, that we're proposing in this presentation. You look at delinquencies on lines of credits. Lines of credit again consistently down, down, down over several quarters across the nation. Okay, so overall volumes are down, average volumes are down. But when we look at new originations under the category of lines of credit, we see in the last quarter, overall volumes are, are still relatively, uh, relatively down, but we see that what has been opened, that the new lines of credit that have been uh, put into the portfolios are generally trending up in terms of that origination risk assessment. Now, not a major concern because we're talking small percentages of the overall portfolio, but this is definitely something where when we come and take a look at it next quarter, it'll be interesting to see whether that continues or not. Average balance by risk amount, you'll see that the blue columns versus the pink columns across the board, that originations are down in the line of credit category. You will see that the vast bulk of the portfolio in terms of new originations is falling in that lower risk segment. Aligns well with the overall perspective, the overall position we have that the, the portfolios in terms of risk are sustainable, that the originations uh, would support that ongoing high quality within the portfolios. Average balances by risk, you will see that the, again, this matches, this matches the narrative of a good sustainable portfolio with good quality originations and good quality existing lines of credit You'll see that the, uh, the trend overall in terms of balances is down, which makes sense and does not, again, uh, cause us any concern. So we looked at the macro data, Christian, and we looked down into more of the, uh, more of the regional indicators with Derek. We took a look at the, the uh, massive uh, data set uh, of the uh, uh, small business credit share. All of that together indicates very strong portfolios, good credit, sustainability. The overall outlook for the small business segment is generally positive. 
tax cuts have void sentiment and optimism, we 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 see uh, that impact may may uh, may fade over time. However, um, again, it matches the overall positive sentiment. Rising rising rates, rising interest rates, trade policy haven't impacted growth yet. We are definitely proposing a wait and see approach as it relates to tariffs. The one thing I would add to that comment is we've seen some news recently where we. Uh, we see Ford Motor Credit, particularly in relation to their F-150 line of products, where uh, prior to the imposition of tariffs, they were looking at 12,500, 13,000 uh, in net profit on each of those F-150s sold. Uh, they believe that the impact of profitability of tariffs imposed thus far, particularly steel, is $1,800 to $2,000 per, per truck. So there are a lot of businesses that support and supply uh, the automotive segment, a lot of downstream vendors, component manufacturers, and so on. So once again, while there hasn't been a dramatic impact thus far, uh, we would definitely say that uh, when we look at the three scenarios from Christian, there's a lot to wait and see, there's a lot to keep on top of, and we are, uh, we will be interested to see what the macro data and the regional and small business performance data tells us over the next 90 days. Thank you for your time. Gary, let me hand it back to you. Okay, thank you very much. Gavin, uh, excellent presentation today, guys. Um, we do not have any questions. It seems like you guys have just provided everybody with just about everything that they needed to know or wanted to know about small business credit conditions. So thank you so much um, for sharing those insights with everyone. If you would like further information, by all means, um, visit moodysanalytics.com. Um, and uh, also for the latest Main Street report, uh, we'll be sending a, uh, an email following the, the webinar today uh, with a link to the latest report. You can go and down and download that later on uh, in addition to a recording of the webinar. And uh, for more information on Experian, go to Experian.com. We'll be back here November the 27th will be the next QBCR, Quarterly Business Credit Review, following Thanksgiving. So um, we will see you later in the fall for our next webinar. Thank you, everybody, for attending today.